eternal life by your resurrection. So, the baptismal robe is placed on the, the, the newly born one, and then as that's done, as they, are, as they dress themselves in their white garments, a psalm is sung. It is the 32nd psalm. And this, this particular psalm celebrates and thanks God for everything that has been made possible in the baptism. And it, it describes what, it, what life is for those not saved, and it describes life for those who have entered into the ark of salvation through baptism. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. All of our sins are washed away through our baptism. Even it is the teaching of the church that those sins that we will commit and repent for after our baptism are, are already forgiven us in baptism. That's why we say when we approach the sacrament of forgiveness, when we come to confession, we are, as it were, again renewing our baptismal covenant. That, that we are tapping that baptismal grace because on the cross and by the resurrection, God has forgiven everyone everything. There does not remain anything that is not forgiven. What remains to be done is that for us through our faith to make this forgiveness of God operate in our life. And so the forgiveness of sins that is received through baptism, that is the forgiveness that we ask to have restored in us when, when we confess our sins committed after baptism. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes no sin and in whose mouth there is no guile. So that refers to innocence. Those to whom the Lord will impute no sin and no guile will be found in them. So the those we come forth from the baptismal font restored in the innocence of our communion with God. Now the next verse of the Psalm 32 describes what life is like outside of God before baptism. Because I kept silent, my bones grew weary through my crying all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. I was reduced to misery while the thorn stuck fast in me. That's describing the life of those who still yet have not yet submitted themselves to the grace of God, receiving his forgiveness, the thorn sticking fast in them. I have confessed my iniquities and my sin I have not hidden. I said I will confess my iniquities before the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my heart. And then it goes on, I'll skip a little bit uh, further. It says, uh, in a flood of many waters, they shall not come near him. The waters that drown, the waters that destroy, we will not be drowned. Oh, my joy, deliver me from the evildoers around me. And then a verse that describes the life that has to be lived, lived out after baptism. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will fix my eyes on you. Be not as the horse or the mule which have no understanding, whose jaws must be held with bit and bridle, or else they will not come near you. We have received through our faith in our life in the church, through baptism, we have received the understanding of God. And so therefore it is possible for us to cooperate with his grace. We don't have to be like, like uh, the horse or the mule that have to be controlled. Rather, we cooperate freely with the grace of God. And then the psalm ends, Many are the sorrows of the sinner, but mercy shall surround him who hopes in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Exalt all you upright of heart. By this time, the psalm has, when the psalm has finished, the newly baptized are clothed in, in their white garments, and they are ready for the next, sacramental sign, sacramental mystery, which is holy chrismation. Now, if one were to read in the Old Testament how the uh, priests, how the high priest of Israel was ordained, one of the things that I'm not going to open, the, I could open the book of Leviticus and Exodus, it's found in both and read it. What they did with Aaron before he was ordained to be the first high priest of Israel, first he was washed, then he was clothed, and then he was anointed. So you see, it is this same order that comes with the baptism of every Christian. That it is as members of Christ's royal and priestly people that we have, that we have entered into his body. So 
holy chrismation, and, and the word chrism, of course, simply means anointing. And as you know, the title, our Lord's title of Christ, Christos, means the anointed one. Christos is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one of God, the chosen one of God. We spoke in the inquiry class about those who were the chosen ones in the Old Testament. There are three types of anointed ones in the Old Testament. There, there, are, there are the priests who intercede for, between, for, for the people before God. They are the mediators, the go-betweens be, between God and his people. They are the ones that offer the blood of the sacrifices. There are the prophets, and the prophets are the mouthpiece of God to his people. They speak the truth about God when the prophets say, thus says the Lord, it is the voice of God speaking through them. And there are the kings. The kings are anointed. And they rule God's people in the name of God. But all of these anointed ones, priests, prophets, and kings in the Old Covenant, they also are types. They point forward to the one who would be the complete and full and absolutely perfect priest, prophet, and king for his people, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who would be anointed not with, uh, not with the oil of the Old Testament, but would be anointed with the Holy Spirit, would be anointed with God. That's why when the Lord comes forth from the waters of the Jordan, what happens is the heavens are opened, the Father speaks, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. You see, that is the Lord's chrismation. That the Lord, who is the anointed one, receives the anointing, and the anointing that he receives is the Holy Spirit. And, and God is revealed in his fullness. Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We celebrate that at, at Theophany. When we come forth from the baptismal font, we also receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the seal of our baptism. Just as the apostles, after the resurrection of the Lord, 50 days following the resurrection, received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended upon them as wind and tongues of fire. And by receiving the Holy Spirit, they were finally able to know Christ and to have within them the power of his resurrection. Before that, they didn't, you know. Even though they had witnessed his, his miracles, even though they had seen him risen from the dead, even though they had heard all his teachings, the Lord planted within them the seeds for the growth of the church. But until the seeds are watered by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church, and, and the Lord himself says that until he is glorified, until he is raised on the cross, until he leaves the world in the flesh. The Spirit will only come according to the plan of God when he has completed his work of dying and rising. If I do not go, Jesus says to his disciples at the Last Supper, the, the paraclete, the counselor, cannot come to you. But if, if I go, I will send him to you. So the Spirit who proceeds from the Father, who rests on the Son, the Holy Spirit who enables us to know God as he is, the, the Holy Spirit who St. Basil the Great says enables us to become God because that is the destiny of our lives, that we become everything by grace, that God is by nature. We, through holy chrismation, are revealed as anointed ones, as little Christs. That's what a Christian is. Christ is the head of the body, and the Christians are little Christs. They are joined as members in the body to the head. So we receive that anointing revealing us as, as members of the priestly, royal, and prophetic people. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, says St. Peter. You have been called to proclaim the, him who has called you out of darkness into his own wonderful light. So... The Holy Spirit is the seal, the stamp, just as the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to be the re Savior, reveals Christ to be the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. So the coming of the Holy Spirit to us is the stamp of approval, showing us to be the real thing, you know, the genuine article. 
if, if in the ancient world the ladder was to be was to be legitimate, it had to have the stamp on it. If the stamp wasn't there or if the stamp was broken, it wasn't the ladder wasn't acceptable. So that's everything that, that is, is spoken in the scriptures about how we have received an invisible anointing. We have received on us the mark of God. God looks upon us and knows his own. All of that is revealed through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit following baptism in the sacrament of chrismation. So the priest says the prayer for those who, who have been baptized and clothed in their white garments and also for those who are being united to the church, who are perfecting their baptism. That when we receive uh, those who are bapt baptized outside the Orthodox Church, when they are received into the church through chrismation, we, through this stamp, this seal of the Holy Spirit, supply everything that has been lacking to them outside the church. The priest says this prayer, first of all, Blessed are you, Lord God Almighty, fountain of blessings, son of righteousness, who made to shine forth for those in darkness the light of salvation through the manifestation of your only begotten Son and our God, granting unto us, though we are unworthy, blessed cleansing in holy water and divine sanctification in the life-affecting anointing, who now also have been well pleased to regenerate these your servants newly illumined through water and spirit, giving them forgiveness of their voluntary and involuntary sins. O sovereign master, compassionate king of all, bestow upon them also the seal of your almighty Holy Spirit. And why do they receive the seal of the almighty Holy Spirit? So that they may receive the communion of the holy body and most precious blood of your Christ. Keep them in your sanctification, confirm them in the orthodox faith, Deliver them from the evil one and all his devices. Preserve their souls through your saving fear in purity and righteousness. That in every work and word, how they live out their lives from now on, being acceptable before you, they may become, until as long as we live our life in this world, we are becoming children and heirs of your heavenly kingdom. And then the prayer is finished. And the priest takes this this precious oil, now we, we spoke of the first anointing signifying healing. The oil of the holy chrism is the sign of the royal and priestly dignity of God's people and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The holy chrism is, is made by the patriarchs of, of the various Orthodox churches. Uh, the service for doing that, for doing that is a very wonderful thing. It's made before, before and during Holy Week. Not necessarily every year, but when it starts to run out. Uh, they, they make it in the church, the olive oil and, and the precious fragrances and essences that are put into it. They, they actually cook it in the middle of the church as the, as the gospels are read over it. And then on Holy Thursday, the day of the Last Supper, the Holy Chrism is, is brought to the, brought to the altar and consecrated at the altar by, by the, the patriarch. Uh, of the church, and, and so it's, it serves as this sign of the unity of the church as, as, as Christ's royal and priestly people. So the priest takes the holy chrism and he anoints uh, all over, all over the body in the, in the early church. Uh, this is something that, that has been lost over the years. It's, it's in some ways a sad thing, you know, just as we use lots of water in baptism. In the early church, they used to take the precious oil of chrism and, and really pour it over you so that it dripped down all over you. And, and they would actually it would be all over the top of your head. And along with your baptismal garment, they would tie up your head in a kind of turban. And you stayed that way for eight days. See, now, now at the end of baptism, we wash off the holy chrism, and it's, it's just a little thing. But in the early church, it was a big thing. They would, they would stay in church all through the Paschal week, all through the bright week. And, and then at the end of the week, uh, their heads would be, would be unbound, and, and their, their hair would be washed, the chrism would be washed off them. So they had this precious oil of the sign of their being uh, uh, joined to Christ's royal and priestly body on them all week. But now it's just for a little while that it's on them. And so they're anointed on the forehead, the eyes, the nostrils, the lips, the ears, the breasts, the hands, the feet. And each time the priest says, the seal, the stamp of the Holy Spirit. And, and then the tradition is that the people who are acclaiming them as members of the church, and of course, uh, all Orthodox people love to do this. As you'll see, they shout out each time. They, say, they shout, seal. So then 
having been, having received the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the, the newly baptized, the newly illumined, the newly chrismated ones are brought into the church and we sing the words from scripture that sums it all up. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, have clothed themselves in Christ. They are not outside Christ, but inside Christ, members of his body. And what remains now for them to do is that their membership in the body be, be truly fulfilled, truly perfected by receiving the body and blood of the Lord, by receiving into themselves that risen body of the Lord that gives the church our life, that is the sign and the promise of our eternal life, just as we say, O oh Christ, great and holy, most holy Passover at every Eucharist, grant that we may more perfectly partake of you in the never-ending day of your kingdom, that, that in the Eucharist we receive that promise, that pledge, that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. In this experience of being united to Christ in the Holy Eucharist, Eucharist. That is the essence of being a Christian. It, it can be said that the Christian life consists of living from communion to communion, of experiencing in our lives that are lived outside the church building, outside the times of worship, that we experience the working of the Lord within us uh, all, all through our, our struggle with evil, our, our attempt to live out our baptism, to, to have actually happening within us everything that has been revealed through this service of baptism and chrismation. So, and that's why uh, perhaps this is the best place to say it because so often the question is asked uh, to the Orthodox from those outside the Orthodox Church, why does the Orthodox Church practice the discipline of, of what is called uh, closed communion? And that is to say that, that only Orthodox Christians who are, who are actively living the life of the church are permitted to receive communion in the Orthodox Church. And, and likewise, Orthodox Christians would never receive communion outside the Orthodox Church. The reason for that most basically is that our, our faith and experience of the church is, as we've said many times, not a private or an individual thing, that we have come to know Christ in that body of believers that, that we profess is visible has, has come to us from the Lord and his apostles, has existed and will exist in this world visibly until the end of the world, that there we find the ark of salvation, there we find the fullness of everything that God has given to the human race. And so when we receive communion, it is not simply me having some sort of private encounter with Jesus, as we've said many times, we don't even have any understanding that it's possible for me alone to have a private encounter with Jesus alone. That for the Orthodox Christian, we know, we know the Son of God uh, together with knowing the Father in the Holy Spirit, and we know him as members of the body. We don't know him as isolated individuals. So, when we receive Holy Communion, we receive not only the head of the body, but the members of the body. We receive everything that the church has taught and experienced for 2,000 years. We receive all the saints. We receive all the teachings. We receive one another. So we would say that in order for that to be possible, one must be a member of the body. And that usually the problem for those outside the church asking this question is, is they, they do not have a realization of this, of this most essentially communal experience of, of, of the Christian church. And, and their, their understanding, many times, and it's, it's not their fault, their understanding is a limited understanding that restricts uh, the, the spiritual life and faith to a, to a private relationship between between God and, and an individual. And that is so different from, from what we, we experience in the church. And also, it must be said that because the scripture teaches us that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it is necessary for there to be unity in faith, for there to be communion, the common union. And that and that it, it is it's sad, but it is nevertheless the reality that that among those who are outside the Orthodox Church, they are outside the Orthodox Church because they either are not aware, 
again, through no fault of their own, but, but they belong to bodies that have either subtracted from, or in some cases added to, the deposit of faith that the church has been entrusted to guard. So we say that, that this communion, which is the most intimate expression of the church's life, you see it is, it is on the level of our life in the church, the, the image of it in, in, in human life is, is the marital union of love, that just as the union of Christ and his church is made possible through the Eucharist, so also the, the union of, of uh, the husband and wife, the union of Christ and church is, is an image of this. So it is, it is for those who are intimately united to that one Lord, one faith, one baptism in his body. So that's why, that's why we, we practice that, that uh, closed communion of, of only for the members of the church. So this will be a, a good place to close. We've, we've been able to, to uh, oh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. The, concluding, the conclusion of baptism after, after baptism, chrismation, and the receiving of the Eucharist for the first time, we have these concluding uh, rites of washing off the holy chrism, which is uh, a sign that everything is finished now and, and now the person for the rest of his life has to live a life of faithfulness to what he has received. And the sign of that, of that is given in, in something that, uh, that, again, has a great deal of meaning and also borrowed from, from the military. You know, if you, if you join the army, traditionally, the first thing that's done to you as a recruit is you lose most of your hair. Uh, and in the church also, and, and this giving to God of hair as, as a sign of oneself, a sign of one's life, also, of course, is present in the Old Testament. Pre frequently, people made vows and, and offered to God the, the cutting of their hair as a sign of the self. So the first offering that the new, that the new, new Orthodox Christian makes to God in the church is some of his hair that's cut off. Of course, again, in these days, it's not a lot, it's, it's a little. But this, this t cutting of the hair and consuming of it in, in the flame of the baptismal candle that the person holds is a sign of one's life now has to be lived, consumed in obedience to God and in love for him. So this little, this, this little ceremony, again, reveals uh, something very, very essential and central in Christian life. So we've seen that in this service of, of baptism and chrismation, everything that the church has experienced that has been made possible for us by the paschal mystery of Christ's voluntary death, burial, and resurrection is revealed to us, is unleashed upon the church. And that is why it, it, is, it is the central ex uh, liturgical experience of the church. And that's why uh, for those who are preparing for it now, for whom it will be coming shortly, uh, should be increasingly during these days uh, having, having your hearts focused on, on receiving uh, with, with faith and humility and love and fear of God, this new life being delivered from death and sin and emptiness and the devil and being given the life of the new creation, being joined to Christ as members of his body and having, having the beginnings of, of eternal life within you, the life that no one can take away just as Christ, having, being risen from the dead, dies now no more. So also those who are baptized into him, if they remain steadfast to the end, death will not touch them, the scripture says. So, so that is our hope, and in, in, in that, in that we rejoice. And now we can have some questions. Father David, <clears throat> as these things developed in uh, church history, when do we see these ceremonies being fully developed? What's what? What would you say would be the first first time in the church we would see that? In the descriptions of baptism that come from as early as as the third century. And perhaps even from the second, uh, the time of, of the martyr Saint Justin, who writes a description of baptism. Already we see the basic form developed, although he doesn't speak much in detail about it. But then by the fourth century, when there are many, many descriptions of what goes on in baptism, because for example, such, such fathers as Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, Saint Ambrose of, of Milan, we have all of their instructions to their catechumens. You, you can read them. And also they gave, uh, perhaps some of you realize this, in the early church, what I just did tonight uh, could not happen with, with a group of those not yet baptized. 
you were you were told about you you were told about the meaning of, of what went on at your baptism after you had been baptized. You you were prepared for it, you know, through through profession of faith and, and, and confession of sins. But you were not told in detail what was going to happen to you. Likewise, you were not given the instruction about the Eucharist until after you had received the Eucharist. So the the newly baptized early Christians, that's what they did during their 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 eight days in the church during their bright week. They would stay in the church most of the time and and, and the bishop would teach them as to the meaning of, of the inner life of the church experienced in the sacraments. So from that time, from the fourth century, everything that we have now is there. Everything, just in the order that we have it. And again, we we conclude from that, as we must, that the fourth century is that watershed time in the life of the church because the church emerges from the Roman persecution and, and is able to do openly what it had to do before, for the most part, in secret. Well, immediately that the church is able to have its own buildings and conduct its liturgy in public, all these things are there. That means they were there before, too. They, they could not be done publicly. They were, not, they were not invented by the church after the persecutions ended. Rather, the end of the persecutions made it possible for the church to do openly what it had become accustomed to doing. So they come then from the earliest centuries of the church's life. Mark? Yes, Father David, in, in most of uh, Protestant America, you would either find someone from a Baptist perspective or possibly from uh, a Presbyterian perspective, both of whom lay also very little emphasis upon the, the sacramental nature of baptism. <clears throat> and they do so for a couple of reasons. There are some scriptures they point to that indicate that a man's salvation is, is a matter of faith, maybe an intellectual assent to things, and then a baptism is maybe something that is that has some maybe historical meaning or, or possibly even some spiritual significance, but they would not attach any uh, real presence or real grace as being as as coming through um, baptism. Um, how is it that they they lost this meaning? What was it? Do you do you have any uh, anything to uh, uh, to reveal the the uh, the nature of uh, of that uh, departure? Well, I think you you hit on it by by uh, using the expression that it is a restriction of faith to to one aspect of faith, and that is that is the intellectual assent to to uh, to the doctrine of the church. Now, it's clear that the intellectual assent for those who uh, as as we grow, you know, of course, we baptize infants in the church again, following the practice of, of the early church. We hear in the Acts of the Apostles that so-and-so believed and was baptized in all his household. So that clearly the, the intellectual assent to the faith for many who are baptized as infants is only something that can follow later. And for example, for, for some people who, who, who may be mentally handicapped, may never follow at all. That does not prevent them from being members of the body of, the body of Christ. But for those for, for whom the, the use, the use and of the mind, the submitting of the mind to, the, to uh, what, has been, <clears throat> what has been revealed to us in the gospel, that is an essential element of faith, but, but faith cannot be reduced to that. Faith always always involves the whole being responding to what has what God has done to for me. So it's it's more receiving of the gift from God in the understanding of the church than than my own uh, my own restricting it to my own intellectual understanding of it. It's far far beyond that. Also. Uh, Inherent in this uh, denial of any, any real grace in the sacraments is a limited understanding of the consequences of the incarnation, actually. That, that there is perhaps not so much a denial, but, but rather a, uh, a lack of emphasis that 
something that we we assert and the church has asserted so so constantly from the beginning that the lord by taking to himself material existence has sanctified material existence and has chosen to use material existence as the means through which eternal life is communicated so that's why we would say there is real grace in the sacraments for the same reason that that the body the body that Christ takes to himself becomes the body of the Son of God, the deified body. That, that the body that is born of the Virgin Mary and dies on the cross and is, is transfigured into the risen body that can, can n never know death remains a material body. Material in, in a way that is beyond what we see and experience now as material, but, but nevertheless material. And so, these these material things that, that are used in the sacraments become signs of that ultimate transfiguration of the whole creation. So, so that's why they, they are so central, have always been so central, and, and the restriction of faith to simply an intellectual ascent is, is a limitation of that. Any further? Susan? Father David, what is the role of a sponsor, uh -huh. and what are some of the responsibilities there, and must you have one? It is, it is the practice. In fact, it's one of the things that uh, I, I want to make sure for those who are about to be baptized. It is the practice in, in the Orthodox Church, again, following, following the, the way of life of the early church, that someone who is going to be baptized has a member of the church who is involved in a personal way with the nurture of that person's faith. It is an expression of this communal experience of the church, that it's not me on my own. And that's why even for the infant that's baptized, what's being said there by the, by the presence of the godfather or the godmother is that the, the, god, the godparent stands as a kind of expression of, of the church's presence in the spiritual upbringing of, the, of this person, that we cannot simply be broken down into either individual units or even, even units of the nuclear family, that there needs to be that presence of the life of the church. And also, I would put it this way, that... Uh, Everyone, just as if we read the writings of the early church, you know, one of the things the sponsor had to do, uh, we don't do this anymore. One of the things the sponsor used to have to do, this was especially in the days, you know, when, when people were coming into the church by the thousands and it was kind of uh, difficult to control the catechumenate anymore. And, and you can re read the Bishop of Jerusalem, Cyril, he has some frustrations about it. One of the things the sponsor had to do is stand up and say, yes, so-and-so uh, over these past years that he's been a catechumen has really been living a faithful life in the church and, and, and is not, you know, is not living a sinful life. And, and in fact, it's written there in the book that I've referred to before from the fourth century, Agarius Travels, that uh, <clears throat> if someone does not have someone to do this for them, the description is given that is it's not easy not easy for him because because then the bishop it says will 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 have a general inquiry in, into the person's life <laughs> so that was the purpose of the sponsor to be to be a guide you could say you could say uh not only not only a, a god parent but also a kind of elder brother or sister in the faith to realize that we are not in this alone so that, that, I would say, is the most important uh, function of the sponsor. One more question. For those of us who were baptized outside of the Orthodox Church, who sometimes are a little jealous of those who are mm -hmm. baptized within the Orthodox Church, are you saying that through chrismation, that which was lacking is made up, yeah. and and by that, can we, can we put the meaning that we've been discussing this evening of, of the, the real essence of what baptism is to us. Can we apply that, as it were, to, to that baptism within the context of maybe a, a Trinitarian baptism, but one in which would not have affirmed these things? Yeah, yeah. We, what, what would be said, you know, there has been a there has been a tension in the church over the centuries, uh, and maybe I better just briefly address this about this question, because it's been it's been a question from almost the beginning. What to do for those who cl who claim to be Christians, who who uh, who the church 
uh, must recognize as belonging to groups that, that teach various false teachings, what to do with them when they ask to be received into the church. And there are two basic approaches. And both of those approaches have been used throughout the history of the church. One of them is the so-called strict approach. And that is to say that we cannot, we cannot assume that, that uh, outside, outside of the church, uh, the necessary faith of the church is present in regard, in regard to, to baptism. So it's better when, when someone comes to be received into the fullness of the church to baptize them all. That's the strict approach, and there are Orthodox people at all times, and who now, that, that is their approach. Then there is another approach, and both of these approaches are sanctioned by the canons of the church. It's not that one of them is traditional and the other is, is not traditional. Then there's also the approach that, that recognizes that outside the church, there nevertheless does exist real, though, though partial and, or incomplete, Christian faith. And so the church grants forgiveness and provides what is lacking to, to what is there. It doesn't mean that the church, by chrismation, is declaring a, a heterodox baptism to be an orthodox baptism. We can't do that. It's impossible. What we are saying is that from, from the seed that was planted there, that included the, the minimum of confession of Trinitarian faith and, and, and baptism by water into the death and resurrection of Christ, that there is, there is evidence of at least that basic faith that the church supplies those things that are lacking too. Now, to that I will say that there, there have been instances, yeah, and there was even one at our last baptism where, where a person, uh, one of the catechumens said that I, I do not have, this, it was after this, having this particular class, and, and this person said that, uh, I am not sufficiently convinced that, that in my baptism, which was formally, uh, was actually, was Trinitarian in water baptism, but, but included so little of what we've spoken of tonight in the tradition of the church. I, I am not convinced that, that, that in my case, that, that, uh, that, that, that is not sufficient for me, and I, and I want the baptism of the church. And, and we've been instructed by our bishop that when a person requests, uh, they are to be given. So that, that's what happens. But, but uh, never are we saying that, that those who, on the other hand, are received uh, by chrismation are somehow you know, received as a, in a sort of second-class manner. The church, the church is the steward of, of the, the mercies and, and graces of God that God has given to the church, and she dispenses them in the way that she sees, sees best for, for us. Now, I would say, I've said this before, this is an expression of, of my opinion, that we are going to, we are headed into a time when because of the great uncertainty outside of the Orthodox Church and erosion of, of basic faith and, and morality, where one cannot assume that even someone baptized in a, in a quote, mainline church in, in the so-called name of the Trinity, in some places it may not be the name of the Trinity, it may be in the name of the parent and the child, or the creator and the sustainer, or, uh, and they still say it's in the name of the Trinity. It's going to become more and more difficult for us to, to, do, to use the so-called more lenient approach, I think. And, and, and the church, especially in the Western world, is going to have to face that we may have to be, we may, it may be necessary for us to be more strict. But no one should worry about that. If you are baptized in the name of the Trinity by water and, and, and there is evidence of that and, and that and that baptism bore fruit of living a Christian life up until the time of entering into the Orthodox Church, however, however incomplete it may have been, one is not to be troubled that the Church has chosen to receive you by chrismation. And even, even, for example, uh, very, very strict, for example, monks on Mount Athos. I know a priest who, who was having this, having these doubts that, uh, that he should have been, he, he would have rather been received into the church by baptism. And, and, and that is, of course, if you are, if you, if you convert to orthodoxy and are received on the holy mountain on Mount Athos by the monks there, you will be baptized. <laughs> But th those same monks said to him, no, you're not, you're, you're not to worry about that. You're, you're received the way the church receives you. So.
Father David, when's the appropriate time for confession? Well, I'm going to I'm going to address that in. Oh, I, I want to have just a short, just five minute uh, talk with those who are going to be baptized this this Pascha after we finish this this uh, this uh, tape session. Okay. Well, we'll we'll conclude then and uh, ask for the blessings of the Lord because we're near the the Holy Week and Pascha upon all those who throughout the church all over the world are going to be united to the church uh, through baptism and chrismation. We've been praying for them all through Lent. And this is this is the the way in which in which our joy in the resurrection of the Lord is most directly expressed in the, the new members that, that are that rise from the font in the image of his resurrection. So a stand and God be with us and with all those who are preparing for a holy illumination through his grace and love for mankind now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.